Yo, my peoples, what's up? Welcome to Shelf Stories, the channel that tells tales from games, books, and life. And also, welcome to the One Stop Co-op Shop podcast. I am your host, Jason. Thank you so much for stopping by for this latest episode of Thinking Out Loud, where I observe conversations and topics that are uh, being discussed in the board gaming hobby, offer my own reflections, and invite anyone who is interested to engage in further conversation in the comments below and wherever else uh, we're having these discussions. So uh, this conversation comes up over and over and over and over and over and over again. I have done multiple videos uh, about this topic. We are talking about board game reviewers, content creators. Uh, we're talking about how do we think about the type of content that we put out? Are we uh, to be trusted? That's the big thing. That's the $64,000 question. Can you trust board game content creators? Uh, who are our loyalties to? Are we loyal to the peoples? Or are we loyal to the publishers who provide us with so many review copies and relationships and all of that good stuff? Uh, in the title of the video, uh, I put it as, are we journalists or are we marketers? And the undercurrent is that if we're not journalists, if we're not adhering to those ethical standards, then we're sliding further and further into the dirty world of marketing. So I'm not going to hide my bias here. Uh, I think I try to be very straightforward with the people as much as I can. My solidarity, 100%, is with board game content creators, uh, of which I am proud to say I am one. And I am also proud to say that I'm friends with a lot of people we're going to discuss uh, here. So I think that in the judgment and the cynicism about what we're trying to do, what gets obscured is the fact that we're just people and we're trying the best that we can. And we have a mission. Our mission is to spread joy and grow the hobby. That's straight up what we are. And so my contention is that this binary, the idea of journalists and marketers, and if we're not one, then we have to be the other. I think we need to bust out of that binary and think about uh, what's happening, what you're seeing on your screen in a whole new way. So I'm going to go into that. And also, this is going to be the first in a series of videos that I'm going to do here on Shelf Stories that uh, talk about what we are, a reviewer self-reflection series, so to speak. I'll get into all the difficult topics. I'll have conversations. I want to be 100% transparent, totally open book. I want to have a conversation with everybody because at the end of the day, what it's all about is building that trust. And I understand that trust has to be earned. And the way I want to do that is by opening the doors and having as many conversations as possible. So uh, if you are interested, uh, please go ahead and like that uh, video, subscribe to the channel Shelf Stories, subscribe to the One Stop Co-op Shop podcast. And to everyone out there, thank you very much for joining me along for the ride. So what is inspiring me to fire up a video here in 2022, uh, early September? Uh, so, a couple days ago, a few content creators uh, posted some really interesting photos. Chip Theory Games, the maker of Too Many Bones, Hoplomachus, a couple other very high-end, premium, $100 plus games, uh, chose about 30 plus uh, content creators uh, to send custom swords. Real swords forged in a fire with a blacksmith and sent out all over the world to some very noteworthy creators like uh, family, Our Family Plays Games and The Dice Tower, uh, Royal Gaviola, Tabletop Tonight, Suzanne Sheldon, a friend of the show, Liz Davidson, a, a couple of people uh, got these swords. And it was really a promotional tactic for their newest game, Hoplomachus. So why they do that? <laughs> they So... um. The Chip Theory Twitter account, and I'm sure other places, uh, talks about their rationale. So this is a whole thread, but let me read the bottom line. Bottom line is that though board game content creators receive a lot of quote-unquote free games, they work incredibly hard for very little. They're essential to the hobby. So raise a sword to the many folks who keep you informed about this incredible hobby. They deserve it. So according to the Chip Theory Games tweet, the reason for the swords was a thank you. Uh, to the role that content creators play in the hobby. And I will get to talking more about that role uh, towards the end of the video. But at the same time, 
the at the heart of what went on was a promotional tactic. They are shipping out Hoplomachus Victorum uh, and the remastered set. Uh, it is on sale, pre-order at their website. So they wanted to get attention. And what better way to get attention than sending out a whole bunch of crazy swords? And it's within the personality of Chip Theory. If you know about their Kickstarters, they use the premium uh, components and they've done things like throw them off buildings and drown them in water and, you know, just to get attention uh, and talk about the componentry aspect of their game. So it, it wasn't uh, totally outside their own experience, but it was a little bit nuts. People were kind of going crazy for these swords. And so as cool as it was, and when there was also some questioning, it is a promotional tactic and it's going through these, you know, well-known content creators. And it's like, well, you know, isn't there supposed to be some independence going on? And, you know, what's exactly the role here? What's the purpose? So I understand, you know, the skepticism that the, a healthy dose of skepticism when it comes to promotional tactics is always good. But the line between skepticism and cynicism the line between someone's opinion and someone's judgment is thin. And of course, you have uh, plenty of folks who are willing to kind of come down and make that judgment. This is not cool. This is not ethical. This is quote unquote payola. And it represents a further corrosion of the relationship between publisher and content creator, where now it feels like creators are sliding more and more into that dreaded realm of marketer. A creator that has the interest of the publisher ahead of the interest of the gamer. So before I get into all that, let me talk about my own relationship uh, with Shape Theory. So full disclosure, I did not. Uh, receive a sword and it is fine i have no use for a sword in my life i have plenty of crap already in my house but i do have a relationship with chip theory which actually goes back to like 2017 uh when too many bones was their only game i had adam and josh carlson on my own podcast every night's game night they sent me a review copy of too many bones so at the time, it was, you know, it was a decent game. It wasn't like blown away about it. My podcast was small. So, you know, we did whatever coverage and moved on. So I didn't uh, maintain that relationship uh, with Chip3, the company. Fast forward a little bit. I think it's like 2020. They started to really staff up and they got uh, more involved in a community. You know, some community managers started to take the helm of uh, whatever Chip Theory was doing. And then they started to contact a lot of different creators. So I remember, I specifically remember that year, people were playing too many bones again. I'm like, well, what happened? I was like, well, the community managers got in touch with the content creators, uh, different people. And you know, they started to advertise the game and now people love uh, too many bones. And so time goes on. Uh, I was contacted by uh, some folks at Chip Theory uh, for the cultural commentary that I was doing. And I was invited to engage in cultural consulting. Uh, I will admit to everybody, Chip Theory holds a uh, special place in my heart because they took a chance on me as a cultural consultant, and I'm proud to have called them my first client. And so this is the first game that I worked on as a cultural consultant, which was Burn Cycle. You'll see in the lore book, I'm credited as a cultural consultant. I also did some consulting for Hoplomachus Victorum and Too Many Bones Unbreakable, and I sincerely hope that I can continue this relationship. So I wanted to be very honest and transparent. I do have uh, incentive to paint them in the best possible light because I want to continue working with them. Now, having said all that, I'm not going to uh, get with a company where I don't feel good about the creators and the staff. I'm mission driven. I want this hobby to be as healthy uh, and inclusive as possible. And I think Chip Theory is on the right side of things. So just as a small example uh, from just something I observed, Chip Theory, they're active in the solo gaming community. And one day there was a poster, a frequent poster on the, one of the Facebook groups uh, named Marina Freeman. She's, you know, just musing. She's very, very frequent poster. Uh, people like her in the community. And she was saying, what's this deal with too many bones? I'd love to hear about it. I can't afford it. But, uh, you know, just tell, someone tell me about it. They sent her a copy. And whatever it was, a couple weeks later, uh, she posts, oh, my God, I got a, a package from Tip Theory. I had, didn't ask for it, didn't pay for anything, didn't pay for it, nothing. They just, it just showed up in my house. Wonderful. And, you know, the Chip Theory just chimed in with a very similar message to what I read off the tweet. They said, you know, you're great for the community. We want to support people who are great for the community. And so that's the story from the Chip Theory end of things. And so far as I imagine my monologues is a dialogue between uh, someone who disagrees, I can imagine the pushback. Well, uh, Chip Theory can send whatever they want to private members of the community, but as content creators, we are looked upon uh, by the community as trusted journalist figures. 
And when those figures get those gifts, now it's a whole new ball game, and now we're headed into dicey ethical territory. And I was going back and forth with somebody on Twitter, and they linked me this page from the ethics of the Society of Professional Journalists. And look at that. It's in big letters. I can't miss it. Refuse gifts, favors, fees, free travel, special treatment, avoid political and other outside activities that may compromise integrity or impartiality or may damage credibility. And so from that perspective, of course, <laughs> giant swords coming from the very companies whose products we're featuring uh, would seem to create all sorts of conflicts of interest and uh, lack of confidence in what we're doing if we were journalists. Board game content creators are not journalists. We're not journalists. I've said it before in previous videos. I'm going to say it again in future videos. I want to shine a white hot spotlight on uh, this concept in this video. Uh, we are not journalists. We are not journalists. We are not journalists. Journalists are paid. Journalism is a paid profession. And with very, very few exceptions, such as the Dice Tower and the bigger uh, outfits that do reviews, we are not doing this for any pay. And so to me, it really stands out when folks want to talk about the ethics of what content creators are doing, and yet the ethics of being compensated for that labor never seem to come up. When we're talking about labor and holding that labor to a high standard, and yet we're not talking about pay for that labor. We're going to uh, call out Rodney Smith. He, you know, we were talking about paid reviews, which is a whole like different thing. Pointed out in one of his discussions that a very, very small percentage of the audience who watches videos actually contributes to Patreons and subscribe YouTube channels and all the different ways in which the community has access if they wanted to to pay and to help creators establish a sense of independence, which needs to be built on a material foundation. It's not just going to be done by, you know, just virtue. Good luck with that <laughs> happening at scale. I'll tell more about that in a second. The pay is almost nowhere to be seen. And so asking for standards of a profession, a paid profession is really, really difficult. And so to anyone who is going to think along those lines that creators should adhere to the standards of journalism, then I would like to offer two responses to that. One, I want to see in whatever post that is advocacy for some kind of outlet for content creators to be paid. Mention the fact that there is no independent outside journalism. Maybe we need to raise the profile of gaming in general. I think the larger society still sees us as a kid's hobby. No, this is a serious hobby with some big bucks. So, you know, advocate for mainstream channels or new channels to cover games, uh, build up their coverage and get some of us hired by those independent places so that we can be paid for our coverage. Let's hear about that alongside all the complaining that we're doing unethical things. That's number one. And so the second part of that is if you're going to hold people to journalistic standards of ethics, then hold oneself to standards of journalism in your comments, in your criticisms. Do journalism. Just went through the whole thing with chip theory. They're a little bit nuts. They're liable to do these things. They've done it before. They'll do it again. And they'll do it for all sorts of folks, not just content creators. Uh, their staff is very accessible. You know, they're all over the place. They're on in forums and you walk up to them in cons. That whole reality is different than getting a gift from a CMON or a Fantasy Flight or a bigger company. Show that you're walking through that work before you render your judgment talk about the creators. It's public. It's fair, it's fair game. That's kind of the deal when it comes to posting and being a public figure. That can be discussed in respect and with openness to dialogue and all that kind of thing. You'll walk through it. They find out if these gifts are really biasing. Let's, you know, walk through their coverage and see if they're not uh, happy with the games or, or uh, whatever the coverage turns out to be, you know? So at least just go through it 
And if it emerges that, you know, the coverage tends to be a little bit more positive for people who got the gifts, then we can have a discussion about that. In fact, I would welcome that. I think that most of the people who I'm talking about would welcome that. It's like, oh, wow, I didn't realize that how much it affected me. So let's have that discussion as opposed to just coming off the top rope with the cynicism of, well, this is payola. This is all that uh, cynical stuff. <sighs> Not with it. I'm not shutting it down. I'm offering challenge on how to approach these questions more constructively. And so for not journalists, and I resist the label of marketer, well then what's happening? What are we? I would say that we map very closely to influencers here in our social media age. What is an influencer? What do they do? There's two aspects to it. Number one, there's a direct relationship with the product maker, in this case, a publisher. Look, I got a whole bunch of folks that are sending me stuff. Look at that. I got still got my burn cycle sitting right here. These are products that the publisher has entrusted us to feature. So that's the first part of it. The second part is the cultivation of communities. The fact that, you know, random folks are logging on to our stuff and we need to own the fact as creators that we have influence over their limited resources. A gamer's limited resources are time, attention, and their money to, to make purchases. And we have influence over that whole reality. So on some level, that paradigm is what we operate under. And so, because we have this role where we have influence over other people's limited resources, I really recommend every one of us who does this, this content creation thing, to log on to the FTC website here in America. I'm sure other countries have uh, different standards for this as well. It lays out a pretty clear set of ethical standards for what we're doing here as influencers. And here it is, Disclosures 101 for Social Media Influencers on the FTC.gov, which stands for Federal Trade Commission. And to me, this is the money quote. The FTC works to stop deceptive ads. And its endorsement guides go into detail about how advertisers and endorsers can stay on the right side of the law. And so that is the most important thing, that we avoid the appearance of deception. And now deception could come in many different forms. It could be the most obvious thing where it's like, I'm feeling great about this game. And, you know, look at all the minis, look at all the wonderful adventure you're going to have. And then when the camera goes off, Bleh, what a piece of garbage. We're not playing that anymore. Or, and this is the definite danger, and I'm willing to talk about this, where maybe the game is kind of mediocre or, you know, this is kind of good. But because we want to maintain a relationship with the publisher and because they gave us this game, it's like, let's put an extra little bit of shine on there and make it seem a little bit better, a little bit more appealing than it might be. That, all that, that whole spectrum is deception. And that is what we really need to focus on. And the way forward on that for a journalist would be to remove all corruption. But again, we're not paid, so we shouldn't be held to the standard of journalists. When it comes to the influencer level, it's about disclosure. Love us or hate us. Uh, think we're shells. Think whatever you want. It is all that you have your opinion. As long as on our end, we are who we say we are. So we adhere to the values of disclosure and integrity. And so this FTC handbook actually has a lot of good advice about how to follow through on that value of integrity, disclosure, when to disclose, disclose anything of value, not just cash, but your review copies are all value. So you got to disclose that and disclose it, obviously, make it hard to miss and all sorts of other stuff like, you know, uh, don't say that a bad thing is good. Don't say that, you know, something is tested or, or what, you know, don't make things up for the publisher that, you know, they're not able to back up. There's so many different little ways in which, you know, a person in our position could, you know, get a little enthusiastic. That's just kind of what happens. Be thorough and careful. These are great guidelines to go through. Cool. Is that it? Did I win the argument? Not quite. In my ongoing conversation with this imagined person with which I disagree, I can hear them saying, but Jason, that's all well and good about influencers, but you don't call yourself an influencer, and neither do a lot of content creators. Influencers are basically low-level marketers, especially as they've developed, uh, you know, celebrity influencers are very much beholden to uh, the products that they're advertising and who does their loyalty lie to, to their, you know, thousands or millions of fans or to the people that are, you know, shimping on products, paying their bills. 
get that. And that's the reason why, you know, me and others resist the label of influencer as well. We call ourselves reviewers. And because we call ourselves reviewers, we take on ourselves the standard of objectivity and independence and not taking undue gifts and all that kind of stuff that comes pre-packaged with the label of reviewer. So my response to that is that this is a semantic discussion. There is so many little levels to this and I don't normally like to do this, you know, kind of reach the dictionary definition because the dictionary has its own problems. But because we're locked in a semantic discussion, I want to focus on the dictionary definition of reviewer and see if I can unpack from there. Quote, a reviewer is a person who writes critical appraisals of books, plays, movies, etc. for publication. Now I'm going to be an annoying stickler about this, but I really want to drill down on this. Check out that dictionary definition. I do not see the requirement that one adhere to a journalistic standard in order to be a reviewer. A reviewer is simply anyone who writes or puts out audio or video or whatever it is, uh, critically assessing a cultural product. Is that possible to do outside a journalistic standard? Is it, is it possible to offer a critical appraisal when one is receiving review copies and gifts and all that other stuff from publishers? It happens all of the time. It just may not look like what some folks want it to look like. So here's my friend, uh, Ben Maddox, Five Games for Doomsday, has even appeared on the show talking about this stuff, definitely on the side of wanting to maintain that critical distance between the reviewer and the game, uh, almost reveling in turns of phrase that are negative towards game, like a you know one being ball shrinkingly bad. I think he said that about Seafall uh, or something uh, of that ilk. And at the end of the day, I think when gamers say they want to trust that a uh, reviewer is giving a critical appraisal. They want to hear that. A lot of them do anyway. They want to hear the cutting edge. They want to hear the meanness. In a way, uh, it being mean is almost reassuring to the viewer. And I've talked about that in previous episodes, how uh, some content creators build that trust, build their community, specifically by being negative and critical and making a brand out of it. And, you know, so because the segment of the audience kind of sees that as, well, they're independent. They're not, you know, shills like the rest of these people. So I'm just not with that. I think that we're not on a diet. Again, we're about breaking uh, binaries. So I don't think we're on a uh, idea of like we got to be mean or we got to be a shill. I think that uh, content creators are doing something different that cuts down the middle. The best paradigm that I could come up with for what content creators really do is matchmaker. The best content creators find the best matches for different gamers out there. They lay it out. Here's the game in all of its glory, all of its warts. Let it speak for itself. And the way that we offer criticism is to encourage good matches and discourage bad matches. Very often you'll hear something like, uh, you know, if you like X, Y, Z, then this might be the game for you. If you don't like X, Y, and Z, then, you know, the, go ahead. Uh, this isn't a game for me, but it might be a game for you or something along those lines. Now, there's a certain segment of the audience that just doesn't feel, uh, you know, satisfied by that. It's like, no, you're not. You're still kind of giving a little bit of the publisher. You're still trying to sneak in a little positivity over there. Really? That's where I hit the citizen wall and that's where I have to pump the brakes and be like, you're entirely missing the core point of what we're doing. We are matchmakers. Why do we do it that way? Because our ultimate goal is not to serve the publisher. Our ultimate goal is not to form the purchasing decisions of the audience. We break that binary. Imagine for a second, take the money out of it. All games are free. You can get whatever game you want. Go to a library, go to the game store. You have access to some people who uh, have all the latest games. What we provide is keys to people's entertainment. Let's say someone invites them over. Oh, I'm, I got Burn Cycle on the table. They can fire up a video and figure out if their time, no money, time, will be best served by playing that game. As a matter of fact, 
I don't care what money uh, pe people spend. I don't care if people spend a cent. I have been doing this reviewing thing for years and I get zero pleasure by, you know, people saying that I spent this much. Oh, you're, uh, you know, you make me spend all this money. And I'm like, okay, cool. Did you have fun? Does it make you happy? That's all I want because spreading joy, growing the hobby, that's what it's all about. And I get this from um, Dan Thoreau, the Space Biff. Uh, he wrote a very long article, very influential on me and my thinking about how he doesn't write about the price of a game. Because there's all sorts of ways in which people can engage uh, with gaming without having to deal with money. And so take the money out of it. I actually would enjoy this more. I'd actually, you'd actually see me do this more. There wouldn't be this pressure uh, from coming from either side, uh, you know, but we live in the capitalist society, so we do the best that we can within the box. And so here we are doing the best that we can. Uh, as I close the video, want to put out there a couple of messages to some of the groups. So uh, the content creators, you know, I, I feel sometimes because of the pressures on us, the pressures to be popular, the pressures on the publishers, the pressures to satisfy the critics and all the other things that we can lose the North Star. And I admit it, I have lost the North Star. So everything that's happened over the last 20 minutes, that's the result of like really intense reflections and discussions about what am I doing? And the only North Star that I have found truly worth it is to spread joy and grow the hobby. Everyone has their own permutation on that. Maybe it's a little bit more intellectual. Maybe it's more slapstick fun. Maybe it's you know, all sorts of different uh, types of it. But at the end of the day, it all comes down to spreading joy and growing the hobby. That's it. No amount of product, free stuff, is worth that. So... That's for the content creators. I hope that uh, all people can find a way to be in touch with that. Uh, for the audience, the, the critics and everybody else, please be careful with what is said and how it is said. Uh, it is not easy to be a content creator. That's why we appreciate uh, the gesture. As issue driven as it is, I appreciate the gesture that was given by Chip Theory that acknowledges that this is unpaid and this is hard and it's not easy to be a content creator, but that we do fulfill an important role. Would the hobby have grown as much as it has? Would it have grown as fast as it has? Would we have access to as many different audiences and potential gaming partners as we have if we weren't doing our thing? If Shut Up and Sit Down, Tom Vassell, and then those gateway people into the niche people, hopefully here at the One Stop Club Shop and other areas. Would the hobby look like it would without us? I would like to think not. And so, you know, appreciating anyone, publisher, uh, audience that acknowledges that, works with us, and helps us to nurture that delicate flower that is our passion. When you bring the weed killer... That I can see where people want to do that, but that's not going to grow a garden. Only going to grow a garden by cultivating the passion to continue to do what we're doing. As I go on the series, we'll talk about some of the other stuff, review copies and publisher relationships and all the other stuff. I'm very eager to hear about uh, this video and as well as other topics that you want me to cover here in the comments below. If you can change your mind, you can change the world, people. So until next time. Later, everybody.